I'm guessing most people here have come through startup school. Um, so that's something that we were like, I was in your shoes um, about 18 months ago. Um, I kind of spent like a summer going through the program. We got into YC out the end of it. So I kind of want to focus a little bit on what we learned during that time today. The main thing I would probably say is um, since we spent about I think we did about three months or so of startup school. Uh, got into Y Combinator in the W20 batch. So January, February, March last year, we pivoted during the batch even. Um, within 12 months, we'd gone from uh, just me and one person uh, to having raised uh, more than $12 million. We had more than kind of 4,000, well, at the time when we raised probably more than 3,000 companies using the platform. So we had a massive amount of growth as well. Um, I think the thing I would stress is Tim and I are total noobs when it comes to Silicon Valley. Neither of us had knew anyone at YC. We're not even from the West Coast of the US. Um, we didn't have a ton of traction. We hadn't sold companies before or done any of the stuff that you kind of read about online. Um, so I want to be, I think we had like a really high, I think we we're concerned that we wouldn't be able to get in um, if we didn't, but we just followed the instructions uh, and like it just kind of panned out really well for us. Um, I think the reason why what we learned we had a ton of pivots early on um, when we we're in startup school. So um, we've written a blog post on that. If you look at postdoc.com slash blog, um, it's kind of in there in the mix. Um, but we started over and over again. Um, we had all of the ideas were problems that we'd had ourselves previously. Um, and we just worked on a weekly basis. So Tim and I would kind of say, hey, like, what are we aiming to get done this week? What's the plan? Like, what are we going to feel like? A good job looks like by the end of the week and sometimes that would involve completely building an mvp product from scratch um getting it out there varying verifying it with users seeing if they would start using it or not and sometimes starting over on that kind of frequency um even during y combinator there are companies that are pivoting multiple times so don't be afraid to start over if it's not working i think the second thing we learned at this stage was um we just got exceptionally good at validating and, and testing ideas quickly. Um, Tim just built the whole time. We found there was a big discrepancy often between what people said they would do and kind of what they actually did. And it's kind of actually sort of where the idea of Postal came from. It's a product that helps you understand if people are using your thing. I heavily recommend you read The Mum Test as a book um, because that will just save you a bunch of time. It talks about if you're talking conditionals with your users, like what would you um, versus kind of what have you done before you'll get quite different responses. The last thing I'll mention, we're gonna give out like a bunch of free usage. There'll be a deal that'll come out that we'll send an email for. It'll appear in the forum um, so you can get free access to at least our product. We have a community at postdog.com slash Slack. Um, so hop in there and feel free to ask further questions. Does it make sense to apply to YC if I don't have a co-founder, but I feel like I need one? I think it is kind of fundamentally important. Like for me, I don't think I would have been able to do postdoc without Tim. I spent all day trying to talk to users, trying to get them to use our staff, doing our sales and growth. And he spent all day building the product. I think it probably does make sense to apply. Um, but by the time you're launching, you kind of need to have someone in. There were solo founders there, but they were in the minority. Um, so I, it's certainly not impossible, but I would say it's probably very important to your success that you find someone else. I think there's Basically, life can be too much of a drag early on when your ideas aren't working, which they're unlikely to in the early stages. And having two of you can really help keep your motivation up and you'll get through the work a lot quicker. I think you can apply without one, but I would, by the time I actually got, like if I got into actually something, I really want to make sure that I had someone down. Um, that's probably kind of tough if it's if you're if there's no one that you've worked with previously. Um, but I think that's kind of just uh, the way it is. I'm interested in your YC interview tips. The YC interview was one of, uh, it felt like one of the stressful moments I've ever had before we got into the interview. So um, we, Tim and I traveled to France, uh, where ours was, because we're in Europe, um, to do the session. I guess it's all probably online at the moment. Uh, we got there and you then, basically the whole thing's over before you know it. I think the main things are don't turn up um, super super early and hang around a room filled with nervous people it will just make you feel worse so in terms of the interview uh, make sure you know a lot about your users in particular i like, give as much detail as you can like if they work at really great companies that are huge um if you've like be able to talk you need to be able to talk about how you've actually solved their problem 
what is your opinion on YC going remote? The batch we did um, was kind of January, February, March 2020. So it's kind of when corona coronavirus kind of hit halfway through the batch. So it kind of started off in person, then switched and wound up being remote. The um, I think there's like, I, mean, I definitely think it would be harder doing everything remote. Like there is a certain thing where, um, I, basically I think the thing that would be really important or one of the things that made a huge difference to us in the first session, like the opening session of the whole thing, uh, Michael Siebel, who's uh, the president of Y Combinator, said that, hey, this gives you a socially acceptable excuse uh, to spend three months where you're completely focused on this thing. Like, it's not going to be the most social time of your lives, um, but this lets you truly, truly focus on your startup. I think probably the thing I would, the way I would approach this now is just make sure that if you're going to do um, the batch, try and get into that situation as closely as you can. Like we wanted, we really just put the startup top for a certain window of time. We spoke to friends and family about all this stuff, um, but that made a huge difference. Like if you can just work until two in the morning, you need to, or work at the weekends or whatever, you're just going to make more progress in this time. It is a set period where you're trying to go from your little startup getting off the ground, doing its seed round out the other side. Um, so I would probably just try and, you know, Maybe if like you can move in with your co-founder and just spend the batch living by yourselves or something like that kind of approach is the way I would think about things. In practice for us, yes, it meant flying to San Francisco and the two of us moving out there. Um, but I would seriously consider like the two, like you and a co-founder or more, um, just living together so you're in the same space. I think that's where the majority of it came from. There are all kinds of talks um, that they'll give that are just online now anyway. So I don't think that would make a huge difference. You have close you have lots of calls with partners and stuff that i just don't think there'll be a massive impact like we started doing video calls with partners ahead of the batch um so if you get accepted you'll start you're able to start doing office hours with your partners ahead of time so you'll start building a relationship before you even go it's it's nice having uh the chance to meet the other founders kind of in person um and over drinks but we're still like very friendly with like we're, we've made friends with lots of them um since we've gone back to the uk online um as we started realizing hey there are other companies in dev tooling for example there are other open source companies so we've sort of found friends um digitally and especially everyone's been forced to work this way so yeah i would probably say it's like 95 percent as good um maybe not totally 100 percent realistically um but i would really try and make sure you set yourself up to be as similar as possible in terms of being able to focus during that time. We don't have revenue, should we apply? This is one of the questions that um, we were wrestling with. So we were, we kind of had this impression that the companies applying have like $5,000 a month in MRR um, and they're really, really quite mature. The reality is that was a complete range when we got there. Some companies were pretty big, um, but I would also say they were in the handful. It felt like kind of like two out of three-ish were very early stage. Like they were ideas, they maybe had a product or some kind of prototype and a handful of users, but you definitely don't have to have revenue. What you will need to have is a really strong view of who your users are um, and why your product is kind of valuable for them and like why they should care. The more you're able to talk about that in the interview, um, it's not gonna matter that much if you don't have a ton of revenue yet. I think the thing that we tried to focus on was demonstrating that we can make a lot of progress quickly. Like when we applied, I think if you haven't got any revenue and you've been working on your idea for like two years or something, then maybe that is a problem. If it's something that's more recent, then less so. So yeah, I think it's kind of two things. Um, being able to talk about how your users find your thing valuable, having, uh, and kind of like, if you've managed to get there faster, it demonstrates that you're gonna be able to make a lot of progress. So yeah, I don't think it's important, but you will need to be able to talk about users at the very least and to do so very clearly. How does the funding work if you're not in Silicon Valley? Office space, funding spend, mentoring, marketing support. Funding is the same no matter where in the world you are, um, which is great. It kind of means it's up to you to decide kind of where you locate stuff. Um, that money is going to go a lot further if you're spending it on people that aren't engineers in Silicon Valley. Um, and in fact, like if you're all remote, you'll probably save a bunch of money. Like we ended up spending like a ton of money on rent, um, flights, um, having to buy some new equipment and stuff whilst we were out there. Um, so yeah, it doesn't kind of make any difference. Um, in fact, if you're someone like Postdoc's an all remote company for this kind of reason. So we have some people that live in Central Europe there. We can get people with kind of more experience for the same pay. So again, if um, money is kind of tight during the batch, but you're not gonna be doing a ton of hiring or anything. So yeah, I like most companies there were just two people. So most people just aren't gonna spend their YC funding during the batch anyway. 
um, because you're going to have nothing to spend it on because first of all you need to work out if your idea is any good. So yeah, I don't think it, I just wouldn't worry too much about that. Can you share tips about the difference between the demo video and the team video? So we basically saw, uh, so again, I'm not a partner there, so I don't know exactly what they were looking for. Our, the way we thought about this was um, the demo video we wanted to, like it's all about trying to make the value of the product really obvious. We used a combination of um, a couple of like very short clips of the product in use and then like kind of sl a slide or two in between. So we kind of said, hey, at the time we applied with an idea that helps you solve technical debt, we saw that there are a couple of steps involved in that. Listen to feedback, um, add it up and then act on it or something like that. So we kind of have a slide that said, hey, step one is this three second clip of the product, step two and so on. So we just kept it really, really short. The video um, as a team uh, just talked a little bit about kind of how we'd worked together before. Um, like my co-founder and I had, known, had worked together for four years. Um, we talked a bit about kind of how we we're getting on with users and the kinds of companies they were at and why we'd chosen this particular problem. So I think it's kind of like everything that's not to do with the product itself. It's more to do with kind of like the value, why you're building this company in the first place, how you know each other and kind of is your team going to stick? When it comes to revenue that we think we can generate, is it bigger the better? This question also depends if we get investment or bootstrapping. This is uh, quite a good question. So for example, um, uh, I used to work at a company where we did just top down sales. So we would only do huge contracts. So uh, the average order value was probably like a million dollars a year. Um, and they would take like 18 months, sometimes longer to close. I think if you're just going for like huge, huge, huge contracts, you're going to have probably quite a slow time to learn. Um, and there's just a lot of risk along the way. I think it's kind of fundamentally a lot simpler to build a bottom up product. It is harder to get to a larger absolute revenue figure in doing that. Like you're going to have to add up way more um, smaller kind of contracts, but you have a faster learning cycle. You get more usage sooner um, and you can kind of always go up market later. Whereas if you try and go up market and then find out that it's not working, um, you're going to have a really kind of rough ride. We, I found anecdotally that it was very hard to build um, a scalable business that way and um, because it just wasn't very predictable what was working. It also means you often end up not building for end users um, because you're going to have to build for like a CTO or something building you know, to sign up for some massive contract. So I think if you have like maybe some unique reason why you should think about kind of enterprise or bigger stuff first, great. Um, if you're a little bit unsure there, I would probably steer towards doing something more bottom up. Um, that tends, that seems to be the trend at the moment, but I'm sure there are a few exceptions. That shouldn't really be a hard rule. When do you make the decision to pivot? And what are some tips for the thought process behind it? How do we make decisions? So there are multiple different, there are a few times, we pivoted multiple times. So I say the first category of pivot that we did was basically, um, even though we spoke to a bunch of people who seemed interested in our, our idea, just no one is using it. Um, at, one of the first things we worked on was a CRM for um, sales leaders that used a lot more, kind of used things like predictive analytics to automatically suggest which deals should come out of your sales pipeline to replace them with ones that were more likely to close. Like if you're trying to start work on a deal for more than say three months or something, there's a huge drop off in the probability that it closes. So we built this way of kind of like pulling all the data out of the sales force, um, running analytics over it to suggest, hey, we think these deals are just gonna die. Um, there's no point trying to work them, like swap them out and give your salesperson a new piece of territory. Um, I spoke to like 15, VPs, heads of sales um, at various kind of startups and scale ups, all of them were ext sounded extremely excited about this idea. Um, in whilst I was out getting those meetings and running those sessions, uh, Tim was building like an MVP version of the product. Um, like a week or two went by and then we sent the link out and literally no one used it. Um, and we thought, hey, this is so far from working. Um, so we decided, hey, like something's fundamentally not right with what we're talking about. And we kind of concluded this is just too complicated and we hadn't really thought through, well, like this is a very kind of engineering heavy complex solution that's hard for people to understand. It's quite complicated to use. Um, so sometimes there's like, if you just have zero traction, like if people aren't even willing to try your thing, um, they're not going to care. I think there's a quote from uh, Paul Graham that's, if your hair is on fire, you're willing to use a brick to put it out. And if you're not willing, so if you're not willing to use something that sounds like it could solve a problem, you're not really solving a problem that they care enough about. Um, the kind of, so that kind of pivot was kind of easy. And um, the second one, which was hard, like the kind that we found harder, and um, we got into YC with an idea around solving technical debt by putting a little kind of survey into people's Git repos. 
Um, it was a pretty cool tool. We had 500, 600-ish users um, and a tiny amount of revenue, like a few hundred dollars a month. Um, so it kind of felt like we had quite a lot of traction. But the, what we found was we're like, okay, cool. We've now got like a free version being used like reasonably regularly by a bunch of users. Um, but we're going to need to monetize this thing. So let's try and sell. And the lesson we learned in trying to sell was um, basically that we couldn't. Uh, we, you know, we had, we're quoting it at a couple of hundred dollars per month per user. And then we're getting told by people who've been using the product for a long time. Like, I'm willing to spend $2 a month per user. Like we had a massive discrepancy. And when we tried to understand why, um, the answer we were getting back was, although this is helping us like log where our technical debt is, we're not doing anything about it. So we haven't fixed the problem. Um, Tim and I then kind of concluded that we're going to have to really rethink this product from scratch. Like the problem is still there, but our product's not addressing it properly. Um, but along the way, we kind of realized that we weren't the right people to solve that problem. Um, like I'm not a, like I've never been a VP of engineering um, and I've never had to work on like a big technical debt refactor somewhere. So, and we just weren't that passionate about it, but we kind of learned that in the process of trying it out um, because we'd seen that problem in our previous kind of careers. So. That kind was sort of more difficult. Um, I think the crucial thing was we got past the first hurdle of are people going to use it? So like, are they going to pay for it? Um, that's where we got stuck. Um, as a result, we concluded that, yeah, we need to either rethink the product from scratch or start over. Along the way, we got so fed up with um, implementing product analytics that we just wanted to go and do this other idea a lot more. So um, we picked up kind of Postdoc. We got way more excited about it and it just fit who we were. So if you're both really hating it, that's also probably a good enough reason to move. I think the general advice is most people are too late. Like if you're already debating, should we pivot? That probably means you should have pivoted like a couple of weeks ago. Um, the key things are to be very decisive. Um, like move straight on to the new thing. You don't try and go back and fix it. Don't become a solution looking for a problem. Um, every time we kind of did that, um, it didn't work. Like one, we had um, someone suggested to us, hey, you should use your tool instead of doing surveys to tackle technical debt, to kind of gauge engineering frustration, to work out, to reduce engineering team churn, which is a big problem. Um, but we hadn't really built it for that purpose in the first place. We spent another week where I just met like a bunch of CTOs, asked them, like walked them through the tool, tried to get them to use it and just no one did. So um, it has to be something that you're excited about. And in practice, like if along the way with the first idea, you've had like keep a log of the problems or annoyances you faced with other systems or paperwork or whatever it might be, um, because that's probably a good place to go back to um, because those are real problems that you've also had. Um, so yeah, don't fret too much. You feel super weird um, changing your idea over, um, but you just can't worry about it. Do you recommend YC for an early stage MVP startup and the founder being the only employee team or is it better to hire team first, launch MVP and then consider? I would definitely, definitely, definitely say like super early be at YC. Uh, they are going to give you the best advice you can get in the world. A, a really strong network to help you meet people who can give you advice if the partners aren't experts in your thing. Um, you do not have to show up there later on. Um, in fact, it's kind of almost worse to do that because your valuation is basically higher if you apply later. So it makes total sense to go there as like to apply as early as possible. There were companies that had got in who are both like idea stage and there were companies who um, had teams of like like 20 or 30 people-ish occasionally, but they were the exception rather than the rule. I would heavily, heavily say just like go in early. You'll just set everything up the right way. Often I talk to founders who've gotten a bit later they've already got kind of into problems with things like the way they've raised money is on paperwork that's not standard. So they're gonna have problems raising like a series A, series B and so on later on. So yeah, I would just say like to get the most value, I would try and get there as early as you can. It's not the end of the world if you get there later, but yeah, earlier is probably better. How long is interview and how does it function? Is the interview shooting questions in a quick succession or are you simply given time to focus on what you think is important? Unless this has changed between now and when we did it, the interview was 10 minutes. Uh, which is, and they have to stick to it because there's a huge queue of them. Uh, you walk in and yes, you're going to get shot questions immediately. Do not, you're not going to be like presenting your idea for three or four minutes continuously and then answering questions. You're going to get interrupted um, and they'll ask you stuff straight off the bat. They don't do that in a rude way. You can tell that the people in the interview are just trying to understand your thing as best they can. It felt much more supportive than I thought it would. They were really enthusiastic, upbeat. Um, so many people in Silicon Valley are optimists and that definitely defines the partners. Like they have to be looking for companies that could be a multi-billion dollar idea. Um, so yeah, you'll get a lot of questions. So um, I would say like we did some prep before um, the interview. We hadn't memorized like our answers word for word, 
but we had spent a little bit of time to um, kind of know just roughly what our framework was for different things. So we kind of knew how, like, which users we wanted to talk about in advance. We knew how to explain the product clearly to someone. Um, we did practices with um, a range of people as well. So we did practices with kind of friends and family who aren't very technical to see if they could understand it. We did um, a couple of practice sessions with um, you know other developers we've worked with before. Um, the partners are pretty good at understanding very technical things. Um, and if you can just remove any fluff, like don't use words like um, like artificial intelligence, machine learning, without being really specific about what you mean. And um, don't throw like high level enterprisey stuff around. Uh, was something that we really tried very hard to avoid, and be able to explain how your idea could be really big in the future, um, because it will probably feel a bit like a toy uh, when you're applying. As a B two B facing startup, where the consumers use our AR product for free. Would you recommend leaning towards consumer success data or retain business industry specific data in application? I would probably just talk about like, again, I I think at a really high level, if you're giving an AR, like if consumers think your thing is awesome um, and your primary focus is getting like growth from that perspective, then I would focus on them. If, you're, if your main focus is trying to get like other businesses to buy your thing, then talk about why they should be buying your thing from you. I think would probably be the way to take that one. What do you think made your application stand up in the crowd? So I get like sent, sometimes people ask me like, hey, can you help look at my application or whatever? I'm happy to have a quick flick through. Um, so again, you go to postdog.com slash Slack. Um, we'll put like a, just message, I'm in there. Um, often when I get applications, it kind of feels like this one's going to get in or this one's not. Um, I think like sometimes when I've seen them, they're just super long. Like they're very, very wordy and I can't understand them without thinking twice. Um, other ones are just very short. like. We tried to explain it to a five-year-old, basically, um, was kind of our concept, even though that sounds kind of dumb. We made the demo video sort of similar. We have, like, pink text in Comic Sans. Um, so, yeah, just, like, very simple um, and really to the point around what you do. Like, go way under the word count that you need that you have for each question. There's a link in the um, like in the comments as well to that, so you can kind of see the video and, and bits and pieces. We haven't put the whole application in there yet, but maybe we should. How many applications before calling it quits? There are a ton of people there who've applied multiple times and got in. Um, I'd probably say if you've spent like, you know, if it's your fifth time, you've probably spent two and a half ideas in this thing. Um, you need to be like either, I think that basically indicates either you're fundamentally not, like you maybe aren't ex experiencing like a ton of growth or you're not explaining it very clearly what you're doing. So I think it's either like, maybe think about changing what you're working on or completely reframe the way you're um, describing it. I think like something big, like one of those two things is probably what I would think about. I don't think there's any reason you wouldn't get in if it's the sixth time, if you've made a dramatic change and you've shown that you've made a ton of progress. Um, and I think it's good practice anyway, because even if you don't get it and like you need to be making a ton of progress, you're a startup to work independent of whether or not you kind of go, go through YC. There are like a ton of awesome companies um, that didn't go through as well. Does a biotech startup have a chance of getting in? Yes, there are a bunch of them. Um, I don't understand what any of them do because I'm not clever enough, um, but there are like a whole load in there. They have partners who are, have a deeper understanding of certain things. I probably the um, the number of them is not as high as there are for like software, um, but there's definitely a group of them. Plus, I would suspect though that there are fewer applicants who are that kind of specific, but there's some really cool ones um, that gave talks as well whilst we were there. How did you approach the first 20 users and what's your advice on approaching users? Lastly, and most importantly, what's your advice on pricing? I'd actually say that pricing is um, le is like definitely less important than the other part of your question. Um, for the first twenty users, uh, my first starting point was I went through LinkedIn. I, I went through LinkedIn and I looked up every single place where I'd ever worked, and I looked through. Okay, we're targeting like developers with this idea. I'll just look at every developer who's worked at every company I've ever worked at. Um, that was probably around ten or fifteen people um, to see if they would use it. Once I got through that list, um, just a real mix. Like I went to. Um, I looked for kind of like real life communities of users that could use our thing. So for example, uh, when we had like a sales tool that we were working on, um, I found a group of heads of sales that um, I joined and I went along, had drinks with them, got, became buddies. I wasn't too annoying, um, but I put like some real life kind of work in. In dev tooling, like I went to meet, like developer meetups um, to have a bit of a chat with people. Um, I tried a few cold messages on LinkedIn. I looked for like Slack groups online of people that were relevant. I dropped some like nice like personal emails to people as well. And um, so I went kind of broad. I made sure all my communication was bespoke to like quite short, um, but obviously not spammy or not mass automated. Um, I think it's kind of a sign that your idea is good if you're if you find it kind of easy to get people to talk to you. I found dramatic differences 
in when ideas were like easy to get a first users for and when it was hard to get them taught to you. And once you've spoken to them though, there's another thing around like they've taught to you, but are they actually going to use your thing? Um, and this is where we had a little drop off with some of our ideas. Again, it's what like Postal can help you out with or like Mixpan or Amplitude or our competitors. Um, but make sure you're also tracking like your actual product um, because you'll probably have like, you may have a lot of drop off or not very much. I think if your users are more technical, you'll probably have less at that point. Um, but yeah. Wow, these questions are coming thick and fast. How does pricing impact stuff? Uh, I think you're very, very early users. I uh, This might be like slightly <laughs> out there advice. I don't think I'd worry that much about charging them. Some YC companies like, I don't know, build, building like, like Boom, building supersonic planes, probably need to think harder about this one. But if you're just building software or whatever, I would probably do like a bunch of users for free. But then I'll, the second step of your learning is then you need to quite quickly work out if you can charge them or not, because you'll get, we learned a ton of extra stuff when we got into pricing discussions. But if we did that first, we wouldn't have had anyone to even talk to in the first place. Um, if you have a bottom up product, I would try and I would also think about your audience with your pricing model. Um, like at Postdoc, we, because we're open source, we approach revenue very late, um, like kind of after our series A. Um, and we knew that our users were developers and we're like, well, developers hate, like kind of tend to hate speaking with salespeople. So we're going to try and make and our pricing is about to go live on our website. Um, but I, we're about to make it all completely transparent, completely kind of usage based, um, just so it's kind of as clear as possible. And it's not, there aren't like arbitrary buckets, whatever. So I would also like connect the style of pricing to the kind of user that you have. How do you work on a UK company with a YC, especially with investors? Did you reincorporate as a Delaware company? So yes, um, we had no investors before the program. Um, but even if you do, you basically do something called a company flip. So you'll need a US parent company um, and then you'll end up if you're an internet and then if you, like if you have a UK child company or a child company in any other country already, it just becomes owned by the US parent company. So you still kind of employ yourselves, anyone else in your team that might be in the UK or in your respective country from your child company. Um, but the US parent is where owns all of the stock in the child company. Um, that sounds like a lot of paperwork. Um, there are lawyers that do this for about $10,000. So if you get into the program, you just do that. Um, the advantage of this though is like if you end up raising from the best investor in the world i think it's like it's arguable but i would say that like the most of them are on the west coast so your valuation is going to be so much higher and you're going to have so much more capital that is like definitely worth the random bureaucracy of doing that flip um whereas i see some people just raise in the uk because they're from the uk i would heavily encourage people to go to the west coast and raise there because you'll be able to like the funny thing is when you raise a high valuation you can raise more money so you can actually go out and do the stuff that you said you would any advice for a solo founder with MVP and without users yet? Get users would be my advice there. Um, maybe find a co-founder if that's blocking you um, as well. But those two things seem like the absolute top things you should do at this point, even if they're free. Any advice for non-technical founders? Can we build MVP using an open platform? I think like you probably need an appreciation of technical. You're just going to have to know how you're going to get your thing done. Um, there are lots of the Lean Startup by Eric Reese has lots of ideas on this, so I would encourage you to read that. There are people who launch as a form to gauge interest or whatever, then use that to recruit their co-founder. Um, so yeah, you can go a long way um, without it. You're not going to be able to. I suspect you're not going to be able to, to like go on forever this way around. Um, but to get traction, to get some idea, and to help you find someone technical, um, that's probably the way. my mentality. Would be hey, I need to get far enough that I can convince someone technical to become my co-founder if I'm not for most things that ideas that I would have to build. Is it safety personal or just super specific when interviewed? <laughs> Presumably. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think if you can connect things to your personal experience um, in your, like, they're going to be more real. So yeah, I wouldn't be like overly formal or anything. Uh, what's a week during YC look like? There are off, there's office hours, dinner, um, probably not well virtual and so on. A week at YC uh, would have started something like, um, I hope your calendar will be filled with meetings with potential users. Uh, that is probably the most important thing of anything that you can make sure is happening early on. Um, they know, they tend to do a talk. They have like someone, uh, they have founders of really successful companies. Um, and I think sometimes failed companies even come and give talks. Uh, I think on a weekly basis, unless it's changed. So you'll have that one evening and it's a good time to go and kind of basically just reflect a bit. Often we kind of felt like, hey, do we really want to go and listen to a talk about some company that's not doesn't seem relevant? But I would say nine out of 10 of them fundamentally changed something about the way we were working. So again, uh, my grandfather used to say, hey, I'm always willing to watch some play sport if it's the best person in the world. 
Um, I think the same thing kind of applies to like listening to people talk about startups. Um, you'll be amazed at how someone different, it's kind of almost a way of getting a bit more diversity into your thinking, I think. Um, apart from that, you'll be spending a ton of time coding, basically as much time as possible, either coding or talking to people. Um, there, you'll probably have like one session each week with um, like one of your partners. And you'll probably have like a group session every other week or so with a bunch of other companies that you'll kind of get your buddy up with like eight or 10 other companies or so. It might have changed a bit since we did it. And um, that kind of means you end up becoming a little bit closer. Like if there are hundreds, a couple of hundred companies doing the batch, you'll become very close with like eight or 10 of them. Um, like we were in a bunch with other dev tools and then you'll learn a lot from their experience too. How important is the other idea section? I've heard like multiple stories of people getting told, hey, like your idea is bad, but we like you, um, so go do it. I don't think it's super important, but I don't really know. What if we're aiming for more complex software, but for the moment we have just built part of it. Should we apply with what we have built so far works or yeah, or do we need the whole thing? I would try very hard to work out what the minimum is that you need. Like sometimes I see people saying, hey, I'm going to spend like six months building this like fintech thing and then I'm going to sell it to banks. And I'm just thinking like, well, it's going to take you so like you're going to spend months, like you're going to spend like maybe a year or something trying to validate your idea there must be some way of validating things quicker. Um, I guess some, like, uh, if it's kind of like a hard, like if it's in hardware or um, something outside of software, then there's probably a different process for this entirely, and I'm not the right person to ask that question to. If it's software-based, though, I would just try extremely hard to find some way to validate it far quicker, like an order of magnitude faster. Like, how do you find out in a week that this is useful? It might be that you can get someone to prepay for it in a form off the back of a website that describes what it does or to sign up early in exchange for a discount. Um, there has to be something smaller or just break or like pr build a subset of your idea or do anything you can to validate it faster would be my suggestion. Your first problem is like, does anyone care um, before trying to build everything kind of out? How old was it when we applied? We'd been working on our idea for a couple of weeks, uh, something like that. Uh, did have team revenue traction? There were just two of us, so me and my co-founder, we had um, I think when we applied, we had zero revenue um, and we had like 10, uh, I, I think from memory, it's in the post. Um, I can't remember if we had any users or if we just got to the point where we had like 10 companies had said they would use it. By the time we got to the interview, kind of a month or two later, and I think we had a couple of hundred users, we had like a tiny amount of revenue, like 300 bucks a month or 600 bucks a month or something and a couple of com and um, so we'd made quite a lot of progress between the two, which was, you know, we were more like, hey, we're not the biggest company ever, but we can show that we've made a lot of progress um, since you saw our application was the way we wanted to kind of frame it. And that made us work really hard um, to make sure that we could get to that point. Can you discuss your short sales script structure template content when reaching out to prospective customers? I think with this, like the top thing, um, it's something that I'll think about sharing um, in a blog post or something, but the main thing really is just make sure that you've like customize it and you haven't sent this to like 900 other people and you've put a bit of thought into it it's super annoying for example to get asked like hey can i have 15 minutes of your time um but if you can see the person's done a lot of work like hey i've thought about this idea here's something i thought could benefit your like this is how i think it could help you and why um now can i talk about it you've kind of earned that um again also sometimes when i think if you're reaching out you need to be clear if you're just trying to understand a concept or if you're trying to sell um i get messages that are like oh um and I, I can't quite tell if the person is trying to sell me and make money off of me or if they genuinely just want some advice. If it's clearly the latter and that's truly your intention, you're much more likely to get the meeting than if it feels like a sales meeting in disguise. So yeah, the more honest and open you are, the better, I think. Um, but just show that you've put some work in. Code is going to start up. Any advice on how to YC when the world has not opened up? That is a good question. Um, I think it's kind of bad. Like the world is going to, like the world will open up again. Um, maybe it'll be slightly different for the first few months. Um, so yeah, I think with that, that's a tough one. <laughs> maybe, yeah, I think if you can show like, if it seems reasonable that it's gonna work the other side, like the problem should fundamentally be there. You should still be able to validate and understand how it's gonna help people. Right, best book I have read lately. I'm an avid reader of books, probably, um, actually Ask Your Developer um, by Jeff Lawson, who is the CEO and founder of Twi Twilio. Um, it's useful for thinking about kind of team structure um, when you start hiring a little bit later. Um, yeah, that's been the best one that I've read lately. On the YC, it says they invest 125k in return percent. They're doing it for every company or just those that they like. For example, the top 10%. I've heard rumors that the deal's different, like online. Um, in practice, I'm pretty sure everyone just 
gets the standard deal. We didn't negotiate. We did um, whatever they offered at the time. I think the amount was slightly higher when we did it because it was in person. It's 150k, but then we had to spend like a bunch of cash on um, like Airbnb. I'm 42. Is an issue for founders' age? <laughs> I would definitely say like a lot of founders there are young, but there's a whole bunch. Like I went there when I was 33 um, and I would say I was definitely in the older half of the group, but there were a bunch of people that were, yeah, like there were probably people up to like their 50s, I would guess. So there was quite a range of ages. Um, there are definitely fewer people who are older, but they are, there are people there. I'm a solo technical founder. I'm trying to decide if I should look for a non-technical co-founder or another technical founder first engineer. I lean towards engineer since I'm the one with product intuition and user knowledge. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think a lot of developers don't back themselves enough that they probably can actually work out how to do sales. Um, I think everyone gets scared because it somehow involves money. Um, but if you, it depends on your product as well. Like if you're going to do some weird top down, like if you're going to do some top down enterprise selling, then sales is going to be a harder part of what you're working on. If you're doing something that's like a bit more bottom up or self serve, um, you like like two engineers, one of whom is like a little bit commercially oriented and is willing to learn. Um, I think is pr would probably the way that I would play that one. Does YC accept companies that tackle similar problems, knowing that one problem can be solved in more ways? Yes. So there are companies that are competing. Um, like Postdoc kind of competes with Amplitude and Mixed Panel and Heap, for example. All of us are YC companies. We're at quite different stages to each other. Um, we have different, slightly different angles to each other. Um, they will take multiple people solving the same problem. How do you attract engineering for your big idea? So I was a little bit, like when we launched Postdoc, um, well, sorry, when I launched like a startup, um, so at first it was just me and I was like, well, I think I should do a startup thing because I can see all this cool, like all this software coming into big enterprises that I'm selling software into and it's all bottom up. And like I was a developer a long time ago and somehow ran, end up running this big enterprise sales team. Um, but the problem is I'm no good at, like I'm not very good at coding. Um, the way I approach this problem is I basically just built like a prototype myself. It was pretty clunky. Um, so I kind of was just like working super late at night, super early in the morning building an idea out one of my colleagues who i really rated tim um quit the company um where we were both working at the time um within like five minutes of learning that he'd quit um i just took him out for a drink and said hey like i've been thinking of this thing um i need someone technical to join me you're the best developer i've ever met like i'm so keen on this that i've even built like a little prototype for it i was blissfully unaware of course that we'd then pivot like five times um but at the time i was pretty confident um and he was too so we thought, well, rationally, if you think about your risk preference, if you're technical, um, if you have confidence that tech is going to keep powering the economy for a long time, um, it may not be that risky to actually quit your job. Uh, like, it's there's a ton of upside with being a founder. Um, and the downside risk is, like, you have to get another job. Um, so we just, like, made, we both say, it turned out that Tim had saved a bunch of money. I saved some money in my previous job, so I was able to commit to doing, like, 12 months we just agreed to do hey let's run for six months uh, we'll see how far we can get if it's kind of working we'll do another six months and then we'll see so yeah just like limit how long you're going to work um before you've got kind of any funding or anything if you're in engineering you probably can feel quite confident that you could just get another job anyway so it feels like it's probably worth taking a shot um if you're in that kind of scenario we're super lucky um from uh like we're very privileged to have been in that position um, but that kind of was the reality of what happened. It would be very cool if there are a way for more people um, to be able to take that kind of risk. We're launching an MVP this week and implementing analytics into our app. Do you know where we can find the information about how should we update our privacy policy? We're not sending data, it's used to create new features. So if you're super small, like to be totally honest, I wouldn't stress too much. If you're not sending your user data out, you just need to be clear about how you're kind of using it. Um, there are lots of templates online for this stuff. So just don't stress about it too much. Use Postdoc if you want. You can host it yourself. That means you don't have to send your data out. Um, but generally, just be upfront um, and look for templates that work, read through the policy and apply it. But yeah, I wouldn't spend more than like a couple of hours on this very early on, but it gets way more important later or if you're handling really sensitive data. Yeah, I think actually I kept it out. Like I, v, the VCs that we ended up raising from later we kept explaining Postdoc really simply. Um, to give you a sense of the simplicity, for uh, like the Series A that we raised, um, it was just like a single slideshow. Um, we didn't have any revenue at that time either. Um, we just tried to make the framework that we kind of got told by one of the partners was like, bear in mind that like a VC does hundreds of, literally hundreds of meetings like this um, on a monthly basis. They're going to remember like three or four things, maybe five tops. So just have like five bullet points that you're basically making um, so that they walk away at least remembering what those things are. And if you're using long language, they're just going to get confused. So I think enterprise language is just a bad thing that's used to like days CTOs. 
Um, so I would happily avoid it for a career purposes generally, um, unless you like want to go work at Oracle or something. Will it help share future prototypes and demo? Like the MPP might be a light version. Yes, I probably would do that um, if it's simple. Like I wouldn't show something super, super complicated or I'd distill it down. But yeah, I think it's probably quite a cool thing to show, hey, this is how it's going to look. How does it feel about having multiple tech collaborators waiting to see who's the right fit for a CTO? Uh, definitely having multiple tech people is normal. Like a ton of the companies have like two technical co-founders. Um, I probably think you do need a sense of like who's going to do what. So, like if you get there and you're both like crossing over each other a bit with who's speaking to customers, who's selling. Um, so I would just have that discussion now or at least say, hey, we're going to try it this way around and then we might change things if it doesn't work out. But yeah, I would go with an opinion on that for sure. Should you apply to YC or go straight to Series A? I wouldn't be able to raise like... Uh, personally, if I'd not done YC, I think the Series A, we, like I don't, we wouldn't have raised the Series A at this point and our seed funding would have been like a third as much. Um... So I would just say like YC every time. If you're more like if you're more experienced than me or more clever, then go straight to Series A. Um, but yeah, it just helped me. It gave me a complete one on one over how to do all this stuff. It's a good idea to show mockups. Yeah, like I'd probably put the mock like our thing was kind of built on mockups for the purpose of the like video demo thing. Um, we put them into YouTube to make it look kind of like a video or whatever. But yeah, something that shows it I think is reasonable. If you're offering your product for free to test users, how long should you keep it free for them? Hopefully, as little, like probably as little time as enough time that they've got back that you feel like they've had a chance to get value out of it. So if it's the kind of product that can demonstrate immediate value, like uh, I don't know, if you're Airbnb, by the time you've like booked and had like a nice vacation somewhere, that's probably like okay, cool. I've got I've got the sense that someone's used it. You can now talk to them and see how valuable it was. Um, so yeah, if, like as soon as possible, but not sooner than they have a chance to get some value out of what you're working on. Um, it'll probably be obvious um, because if they keep using it repeatedly it's probably valuable. Um, so at that point, you can probably talk money with them. Should we mention founding members in the application who are working part-time or full-time on the application? Yes, so um, I think it asks you who's working on this thing. They'll want you, they'll want to know that you're able to work full-time on the idea. If someone's kind of working part-time and is considered a founder, um, I think the fundamental challenge is like they're not fully committed to it. Um, so by definition, you're not backing yourselves. Um, so why would YC back you? Is it negative if someone is part-time? I think in the short run, no. Like, if someone has to be part-time to, like, start something up, great. And then if you get into YC, I think you'd go full-time. Just make it clear that you would go full-time. So there are people in the batch who um, were, like, doing their master's degree or whatever who were just wrapping it up as the program started. Um, but as long as, like, it's clear that you're going to transition out and you're going to work on it full-time, I think that's the one thing. And again, like, an interview stage, maybe it's like, hey, like, our plan is to go full-time in this thing, blah, 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 and then just do that if it happens. You definitely won't be able to do both at once um there was just too much you just you have too much you should you will feel like you have too much work to do by far for just a normal person anyway so if you've got another job there's like absolutely no way it would work any suggestions tacking company operations like payroll benefits accounting yes so um yeah i would basically pay someone to do these things for me using the pre-seed funding that i get like most places you don't have to actually so um uh when we launched originally before we got into yc um I think I made like seven, I don't know, about eight thousand, or probably the equivalent of about ten thousand dollars through. I did some like consultancy for two days a week for the first three months, and that gave me about ten k roughly, um, which we spent on stuff like that where we knew we kind of needed it. Um, there are like various ways you can get accountancy for free depending on which country you're in, if they can like register tax claims and stuff. So. Yeah, um, once you're actually in the batch, um, I would heavily just say, like, get someone else to pay for that stuff um, because you're just going to get really stressed and you'll probably end up going to prison because you won't file some tax return on time or something. I don't know. What's the, the future post -talk? Anything, like, on the shelf? So uh, with post -talk, we're trying to get mass adoption in engineering and product teams for now. Um, in the long term, like, in the moment, what we try and do is help... We're trying to increase, basically, the number of successful products in the world. It's why we, like, shop to stuff like this. Like, we just want to help out. Um... For now, that means product engineering teams understand their user behavior and being able to act on it. We're building in things like session recording, feature flags, um, product analytics. So it's a lot broader than kind of what else we saw out there. And it's open source, so it's free um, if you want to start off without any budget or whatever. Longer term, I think decisions in sales, marketing, customer success will also get driven by user behavior in products. Um, but in the immediate future, there's like a whole bunch of engineers who could do with a better understanding of what's happening in their thing. Would it be a problem if founding team members are not technical and not web developers? We want to outsource the platform to a web dev studio. I think there might be some specific YC guidance on this. Basically, if you're a software company, your core competency is software. Um, so I would probably really try not to do that. It's maybe like a really temporary solution or something. But like long term, if software is your bag, like you have to, I really think you have to own it. Um, 
I think it's very important. We've made a decision for us to work on the open access product open website open handbook. Where's your line? What's private and why? And um, the absolute bare minimum is what we keep private. Um, basically, all that means is things that have like a negative signaling connotation. So, for example, um, like if we're partway through like a fundraise, we won't write up that we're halfway through this fundraise um, because it could just like I think it could just go kind of screwy with the way that investors would read into that. Like it might sound like we're struggling or we don't share things like our revenue figures publicly, basically because like a competitor could be like, oh, they're only doing like this much revenue or they have this many users. We have X users where X is greater than Y. Um, so I just think there's probably like a couple of small problems, but um, we're pretty happy to talk about pretty much everything else though. Like you can look up like our expenses policy. You can even suggest changes to it. Is it negative if you and your founder are in different time zones? I don't know what the impression is for this. If it's, if like, I think we're not like miles apart. I don't see why it's a big deal. If everyone's trying to work all remote, I probably would make an effort though to live together um, because I think you'll just find it a bit easier. If you, especially like if you get into the batch, if you're not in the batch and you're just working your startup, I think it's kind of reasonable. It's, I definitely think it's reasonable to work this way. Like my co-founder is in Switzerland. I'm in the UK. We're like an hour apart and we work remotely. Like we haven't been able to see each other since in real life um, for months and months and months because of COVID. Um, and we haven't really had any problems because of it. Uh, do they send an email for the interview? Um, yes. Uh, I can't remember how long it took, if I'm honest. Um, I would probably be frantically refreshing YC Twitter and Reddit at the moment. Any final advice on how to prepare? Just have like clear frame. Basically, you have to be able to explain it to someone like a five-year-old. Uh, if you can do that, um, you're probably fairly set. Um, you need to have rational answers to stuff. Don't use long words. Cool. Uh, we are at time. Uh, thanks ever so much for joining me. Um, our plan is to run these on a fairly regular basis. Um, we'll drop you uh, an email uh, with when, whenever we're going to do like the next one. Pop like go to postal dot com slash slack join us there if you want to ask stuff in between and just pineapple long pizza absolutely not under no circumstances pineapple long one pizza um cool right thanks so much speak soon take care